serves as the associate dean serves as the Associate Dean for Diversity and Faculty Development in the School of Education at Johns Hopkins University and maintains a faculty appointment as Professor of Counseling and Educational Studies. Prior to joining the faculty at Johns Hopkins University, she held tenured faculty positions at the College of William and Mary and Virginia Tech. Dr. Davines' research agenda examines the importance of multiculturalism as an indispensable tool in the delivery of culturally competent counseling and educational services for clients and students from marginalized groups. More specifically, she specializes in the measurement of attitudes towards discussing the contextual dimensions of race, ethnicity, and culture with ethnic minority clients and students, and the identification of specific strategies that reduce barriers to well being. Her scholarship has appeared in leading journals such as the Journal of Counseling and Development, the Journal of Multicultural Counseling and Development. The Journal of Measurement and Evaluation in Counseling and Development, Professional School Counseling, and Academic Psychiatry. She has received more than $5 million in federal and state grants to address mental health and wellness concerns with school aged children. Dr. Dave Vines was recognized with an Exemplary Diversity Leadership Award in 2013 by the Association of Multicultural Counseling and Development. In 2018, she received an Excellence in Teaching Award at Johns Hopkins University. In 2019, she was awarded a presidential citation from the American Counseling Association in recognition of her scholarship on multiculturalism. And in 2024, she received a Career Impact Award from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Dave Vines earned her bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her master's and doctorate from North Carolina State University. Welcome. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you, Zofia, for inviting me. I'm excited about being here, and I just uh, thank all of you for attending uh, because I believe that issues around diversity, equity, inclusion are so important um, as our society becomes increasingly more diverse. So I'm going to uh, start with a definition of broaching. And so when we talk about broaching, basically we're talking about exploring or examining issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture that are likely to be germane to the, the patient's presenting concerns. Um, I know when you take a course on sort of techniques, one of the things you talk about is uh, like paraphrasing. Um, how, do you, how do you paraphrase? When we paraphrase, we pay selective attention to the most important uh, thing that the patient may say. When we broach, we're doing something similar. We're paying uh, selective attention to the most important things that clients say around race, ethnicity, and culture. Um, and so uh, basically that, that's what we mean when we talk about broaching. Um, I gave an example earlier this morning about why broaching is, uh, why broaching is important. Uh, I'll share a different story, but I teach uh, counseling techniques, I teach cultural diversity courses, and one of the things we often have students do is engage in peer helping relationships. So before we put them out in the field, um, they will practice be what it's like to be a counselor and a client. And oftentimes we do that because students haven't had any prior experience in counseling. This is a topic, a, a, a field that they're interested in, but not everybody has had an opportunity to be a client. Um, and typically in my counseling techniques course, we have three counseling sessions. And we've, you know, like the first one, we focus a lot on finding out what the uh, presenting concern is, focusing on informed consent. The second, we go deeper. The third is when we broach. Um, so I had a, 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 a student, a white student, who was counseling a South Asian student, and the presenting concern was um, uh, being in a long distance relationship. So this young woman was in a long distance relationship, and she was, you know, she was struggling. And so the first two sessions, it just seemed like the struggle was just about being so far from home, being so far from uh, her partner. The third session, the, the, the um, the counselor broaches and it goes in a different direction you know she's paying selective attention to cultural concerns that may be related and the the question now is what is it like for uh, you as a south asian woman um being in a long distance relationship 
and the floodgates come open, but there's also, a, you know, sort of a pivot. And the student talks about, you know, like, I'm 25 years old. My parents don't even think I should be here. I'm supposed to be home, uh, married, making babies. And so that's very different than I miss my boyfriend. And so when we ignore issues around race, ethnicity, and culture, um, we may not get the full um, extent of what a client or a patient is experiencing. So that's why we bridge. Another thing is that we've been conditioned not to talk about issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture um, because that's sort of uh, taboo. We don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. And so um, because the U.S. psychiatrists wield the balance of power in the um, therapeutic relationship. It's going to be incumbent upon you to ask these questions and explore to what extent issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture um, is important. When we talk about uh, making issues related to race, ethnicity, um, uh, hang on a second. I don't know what slide I'm on. When we talk about having um, these conversations, again, we don't want to, you know, sort of make someone's race, gender, sexual orientation, the focus of what's going on in their lives. But it's likely that these identity dimensions um, may impact their lives in, in meaningful ways that warrant discussion in, in, in counseling. Um, and so I think that's um, important. Again, another thing that, um, uh, that I would say is that when we broach, uh, the counselor wields or the psychiatrist wields a balance of power. And so if you don't ask these questions, the, uh, the client or the patient may compartmentalize their lives in ways that these things don't come out unless you ask explicitly. Another thing we probably won't have time to really uh, get into, uh, but one of the things I, uh, that students often ask, well, what if it's not important to the, the patient? That's fine if it's not important to the patient that you just, you know, you keep going on whatever you were planning to do. Um, I said earlier this morning, my experience doing supervision over the last 27 years has been that sometimes um, students who are engaged in mock counseling sessions or when they get into the field, um, uh, people will say, oh, I really don't have any concerns about race, ethnicity, and culture in the moment when they're asked. But upon later reflection, they sort of delve into the connections um, that are there for them. So uh, because you wield the balance of power, it's important for you to at least put it on the table. And you're using that as a diagnostic tool. If the patient wants to talk about it, you continue talking about it. If they don't, you let them know that, you know, we can come back to that later on. Um, but at least you have, uh, at least you have asked. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, sometimes students get upset uh, when they feel like I've asked and the patient and the client said, this is not something I need to talk about. And so what I often say to that is when you are at a restaurant, let's say you're at a, 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 a you're doing engaged in fine dining and you're at a restaurant and uh, you have a nice steak dinner and the waiter or waitress comes and asks, would you like some kind of sauce, Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce or whatever? And you say, oh, no, thank you. They don't run back in the kitchen and say, oh, no, they, 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 I asked them if they want a Worcestershire sauce and they said, no, they didn't want it. What am I going to do now? That's a diagnostic question. You know, the waiter will probably say to you, well, if you don't want any now, that's fine. But if you do at a later time, I'm happy to get it for you. Think about broaching in that kind of context. If you bring it up um, and the person doesn't want to talk about it, that's fine, but they may come back to it later. You've communicated at the very least that it's okay to have this conversation. We live in a society, Bell Hooks said we live in a society that is rooted in denial and repression, um, which makes us not have these conversations. So again, it's important for you to have these conversations. Um, we don't have a, an oppor a, really um, an opportunity to go into a lot of detail about uh, the rationale. But one slide I did want to, I did, there are two slides I want to show you. One slide I did want to show you is about representation. And so you can take a look at this, um, uh, the demographic information about um, people in psychiatry and the different disciplines in psychiatry. And you can look at the underrepresentation of um, minoritized practitioners um, and, um, uh, relative to the US population. And so there's a, you know, sort of a, there's a dearth of um, people of color in psychiatry. Um, and one of the things I would say is that we need to address that issue in terms of increasing the pipeline. But um, we also need to make sure that everybody is equipped uh, to work effectively with people from minoritized groups. When I first started in, in counselor ed, the, a lot of the research focused on 
pairing um, the counselor with the same race client. Uh, and the research is still sort of un unequivocal, uh, you know, sort of about that. Um, but one of the things I say, if only same race providers can work with same race patients, then I've wasted almost 30 years of my career because everybody should be able to work with everybody else. Um, this other slide, I really like this slide. Um, I, like, I like this slide. I'm going to move over here. Um, when, another rationale for broaching issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture uh, is, has to do with uh, the high rates of premature termination among patients and clients. This is based on um, uh, psychology, but I would imagine that de depending on what kind of psychiatry you're practicing, the results may be similar. So you have four therapists. Um, the blue column um, has to do with uh, sort of white clients, um, and the REM is racial ethnic minority cli uh, clients. So therapist one has high rates of premature termination with both white and racial ethnic minority clients. Therapist two has low rates of premature termination with both white and uh, racial ethnic minority. Um, uh, therapist three has low rates with white um, clients, but high rates of premature termination with racial ethnic minorities. And the reverse is true for therapist four. Um, uh, people used to think that it, it was a race of the counselor that mattered, but, but one of the things we talk about now is is the skill set of the counselor, the provider that, you know, sort of that matters. And so the skills that you bring to bear are, um, are important. One of the things that, that um, I would say when we talk about termination and premature termination, it has been variously defined, but there are many ways of terminating prematurely. Uh, one is where, um, uh, of terminating, excuse me. One is where um, the provider and the patient agree our time has we need to wrap things up. Another is where the patient may say, our time has come, or I'm going to move in a different direction. But um, uh, a, a third is where both the patient and the provider uh, agree mutually that um, the time has come. But the fourth, and the probably the most problematic, is where the client doesn't come back at all. You know, they're like, I'm done. I'm not going to have a conversation um, about this, um, and then I'm, I'm not coming back. Uh, another thing that I would say, and I think I mentioned this just briefly, uh, ruptures are what, um, therapeutic ruptures are what sort of often prompt people to leave, not feeling heard and understood, not feeling valued, um, experiencing microaggressions in session, maybe fa you know, factors that contribute, not feeling heard and understood, being dismissed. Um, so when we think about broaching, a rationale is to, so that we have people that are more engaged in the, um, the therapeutic process. So um, one of the things that we did years ago is we came up with this model that we call the continuum of broaching behavior. And we said that people broach, but it's on a continuum. And then we identified four, really five categories, but we were able to find empirical support for four categories. Um, we identified the avoidant category, the continuing congruent category, the integrated congruent category, and the infusing category. If you look at this chart, I mean, or this slide, one of the things that you'll see is that um, Avoided and continuing congruent are below the dotted line, which suggests that there are more problematic ways of, of, of addressing broaching. And integrating congruent and infusing are above the dotted line. So I'm just going to describe each of the different categories or styles of broaching. The avoidant provider does not discuss issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture at all. So issues may come up and they will pivot away, not talk about it, redirect the patient's attention to more neutral kinds of concerns. Um, they, um, and they're for a number of reasons. Sometimes people avoid these conversations because uh, if I bring this up, maybe the patient is going to think I'm biased. Uh, once I bring this up, what am I going to do now? You know, I, I don't feel like I'll have any control over the session. And so um, how am I going to, uh, uh, how am I going to proceed? Uh, do I have the knowledge base uh, to engage in these kinds of uh, discussions? In any case, not being able to have these conversations for patients for whom issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture are important may mean that they don't get their needs met. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, avoidant style. 
The continuing congruent style is where people broach, but they do so awkwardly, mechanically, and effectively. You know, they, they have the right intentions in mind, but they don't have the skill set, they don't have the tools, they struggle to um, uh, broach. And as a result, they, ha they are unable to translate the client's presenting concerns into meaningful counseling interventions. Um, the third category is integrated congruent category, and this is where we expect providers to be, where um, they can uh, recognize it, that discussions need to occur around race, ethnicity, and culture. They talk about it in meaningful and substantive ways. They discuss it er early and consistently, um, and they validate and affirm the, you know, the patient's concerns um, without um, sort of uh, blaming them for their uh, concerns. And so um, they have strategies and tools that they'll use in their arsenal to help people process what is going on with them. So again, this is the ideal place to be. The fourth category we put on the, on the continuum because this really has to do with social justice advocacy and systemic change and where you recognize something, bless you, you recognize something is going on and um, uh, that needs attention. And so you lobby or advocate on behalf of your patients and likely that would occur outside the context of counseling. So I'm gonna go back a couple slides see what kind of time do we have. I'm going to just give you, um, and, and maybe I was going to let you talk in, in small groups about this, but what perhaps, um, where do you think people are, or where do you think you are, if you had to describe where you are on the continuum? Would any brave soul like to talk about it? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think I, first I want to say thank you for sharing, because I think that's where a lot of people are um, in terms of um, their skill set. I think another thing that um, you brought up that is really important, we may be really effective at working with some populations versus others. So, um, uh, and the other thing that happens is we think that, okay, oh, Norma's black. So we're going to put her with the black patients, but not recognizing that there are a lot of differences between people based on uh, their race, ethnicity, just all, any number of dimensions. So, um, uh, so while I may be, I consider myself a U.S. slave descendant. So while I may be more effective or comfortable working with others um, who've had a, a 400 history year history in this country, um, it may be um, a, more difficult sometimes working with continental or Caribbean um, African Americans. So we can't assume that just because we put people together that they are going to work to work effectively. We have to think about issues around. Um, I don't know, I'm gonna try. <laughs> we have to th we have to think about um, we have to think about issues um, around social class. We think about issues around religion, issues around immigration status. That's another area where these um, differences may you know so differences may come up between the provider and the patient that we need to sort of take into um, take into consideration. So um, you may not be consistently continuing congruent. You may not be consistently integrated congruent, but it may depend. It's contingent upon the population with whom you're working or the relationship you have with the client. Any thoughts before we move on? Any other thoughts before you move, we move on? Did anybody else want to share where they think they are on the continuum? We'll move on because then we don't have a lot of time. So when we first developed this model, 
one of the things that happened, like I would go to presentations and people would think that when you broach, you're talking about, I'm this and you're that, how do you feel about working with me? And that is part of it, but it's not the whole of it. And so um, I developed the multidimensional model of broaching behavior. The other thing people thought that when you broached, you only broached to talk about racism and discrimination. And one of the things I say is that as an African-American woman, I've had a fair amount, I've experienced a fair amount of racism and discrimination in my lifetime, but that does not define me. There's, there's so much more to my life and my experience than the encounters I've had with oppression. So um, as, a, as a heuristic device, um, we wanted to come up with a model that, you know, sort of help people sort of better understand um, different dimensions. So we came up with um, intra-counseling dimensions, intra-racial, ethnic, and cultural dimensions, intra-individual, and intra-racial, ethnic. And we're going to take a minute and go through um, each, of, each of those um, dimensions. So when we talk about intra-counseling dimensions, basically what we're talking about is we're talking about um, the counselor and the client. Like, how are things going between us? I talked a little while ago about cultural immediacy. How are things going be between us? And so there are a number of things that we want to do when we broach intra-counseling um, dimensions. Um, so we want to address shared and different identity dimensions so that we um, sort of explore uh, the counseling relationship. Um, uh, so I have a, a videotape that I do with a former student who's from Sudan. And um, in the tape, I say we're both African origin women um, and um, uh, talk about some other similarities when I say, but we have, and although we share the same racial designation, we have different ethnic designations. And I want you to feel comfortable talking about yours. I also realize that there may be times when I don't fully understand your experience and I, you know, I want you to feel like you can correct me um, or that we can have a conversation about it. Now, some people would say that doesn't, you know, that doesn't making that doesn't make any sense, or maybe you're conceding power, or whatever. However, people might um, describe that. But for me, it's like talking about the elephant in the room. When I sit across from her, she knows I've never been to, to Sudan. She knows I don't know much about her culture. So I'm just stating the obvious and putting it in the room so that I want to communicate. It's okay to talk about your culture. Um, the second part of this is um, divesting ourselves from our expert status by acknowledging our limitations. So we're not trying to, we're, we're not, um, the purpose of doing this is to sort of talk about the obvious. The third thing we want to do, and we do this in counseling, I don't know the extent to which you do it in psychiatry, is to work to reduce the power imbalance. And we want to try to create an egalitarian relationship um, with, the, uh, the, uh, with the client. We also want to let the person know it's okay to talk about your race, ethnicity, and culture here because there's so many places that we can't have these conversations. And the consequence of which is that we strengthen the therapeutic alliance. One of the um, one of the state, I love this article, Cardmill and Battle, and I can send this to you if you if you want it. But it provides excellent examples of how to have these conversations. So, if you feel like you're in the continuing congruent category, not because you don't understand the dynamics, but you don't know how to start a conversation, this article provides a number of wonderful examples. Um, but the person the, the, in the article, this is the sample broaching statement. I know that this can sometimes be a difficult topic to discuss, but I was wondering how you feel about working with someone who is from a different racial ethnic background. I ask because although it is certainly my goal to be as helpful to you as I possibly can, I also know that there may be times when I cannot fully appreciate your experiences. And I want you to know that I'm always open to talking about the topics whenever they are relevant. So um, I, I feel that the person in this statement um, um, it's, it's expressing a sense of curiosity. Like, how do, you, how do you feel about our work together? It's not, I'm this and you're that, but how is our work together? Is this helping um, or is this hindering you? I think another important part is the rationale. I'm asking because I wanna be helpful, um, that I know that I'm not always gonna know everything, but I'm open to, and that's the cultural humility, I'm open to learning and better understanding about your experience. So I think I think we have enough time. I, I won't be able to show you all four videos, but I think we have enough time. We said, do, do you think the videos are going to, you don't think they're going to show up? The, 
The, on the, okay, well, so we won't be able to see that then. Sorry about that. But this is intra-counseling dimension. So intra-counseling dimension helps us um, facilitate conversations with uh, the patient about how our relationship is, is going. Um, and one of the things that we know is that from the research literature is when you broach, the person talks in more depth about their inner experience. I've learned so much just by listening. One of the things I say is um, after, after my father passed away, we would call, my sister and I both lived out of town. And so we would call my mother every single solitary day. And so it was unusual for her to call us because we called her every day. And then um, one day she called me out of the blue and um, she said, Norma, you didn't ask me why I called. Because usually if she, called, if she initiated the call, there was a reason. She said, Norma, you didn't ask me why I called. I said, I don't have to ask you why I called. If I listen long enough, I'm going to learn why you called. And I think sometimes, at least with, with my students, they have this agenda in mind. I'm going to ask this question, this question, this in this sequence, and then you know, sort of will be done. But many times our, 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 our clients talk in nonlinear ways. So we want to be open to their experience and, and um, how, they, how they choose to share it. Um, the second dimension is intra-individual dimensions. And for this dimension, we draw on um, Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality. In counseling, I think we, um, early on, we got it wrong because we talked about intersectionality as a collection of different identities. But that's not what Kimberly Crenshaw meant when she talked about intersectionality. She was talking about um, multiple identities, but those multiple identities carry with it multiple oppressions. So the way I feel oppressed sometimes as an African-American woman, maybe the same way I may feel oppressed um, as, um, as an African-American, maybe the same way I, f I feel oppressed as uh, a woman, maybe the same uh, way I feel oppressed as an aging person. I didn't realize, you know, things really change when you age. Um, <laughs> um, so there are multiple oppressions and there are sort of patterns and similarities in terms of how we experience this. And so we don't want to uh, reduce um, an individual to a single identity domain, but we want to make sure that we integrate and synthesize all of this. One of the things um, I will say, and this is why cultural immediacy is so important to continue check in, checking in with the, with the patient constantly. Um, I used to make video demonstration tapes um, for class for teaching purposes. And I, I can't remember what theory I was using at this point, but I was doing a video demonstration with um, my husband and I thought I had done a brilliant job counseling him. I knew him very well <laughs> after all. And so I said, you know, sort of real confidently, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get the chance to talk about? And he says, yes, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't get to talk about religion. And so in that moment, I was like, wow, you know, this is something that it, it was really salient for him. This is something that's really salient for him, but I omitted. And so that that cultural humility, that openness to the client's experience is important in terms of making sure we address all of the do domains that are important to the to the client. Um, the uh, second broaching statement is I often ask my patients about their cultural background. Because it helps me to have a better understanding of who they are. Is that something you'd feel comfortable talking about? Again, reducing the power imbalance, is, is that something you feel comfortable talking about? Allows the patient to decide whether or not they want to talk about it. Um, the rationale, I often ask my clients uh, because it helps me better have an understanding of who they are. And it doesn't sort of force the person to talk about just their uh, religion or just their sexual orientation or just their gender or just their social class, they get to choose. So the, the patient has agency when we think about um, uh, intra-individual dimensions. When we think about intra-racial, ethnic, and cultural dimensions, um, we think about um, the patient's relationship to those in their social world, whether it's family, community, others um, that are in their, you know, their domain. And um, sometimes families, as we talked earlier, can provide it can be the source of a lot of distress. But sometimes families can be the source of support. So sort of talking about, you know, how, you know, how does family sort of weigh in on this, uh, you know, sort of concern that you have. Um, so Marisol, here's a sample statement, it sounds like you're feeling rejected by your friends because they say you're not Hispanic enough. Is that your sense of what is going on? So acknowledging some of the tensions within communities, 
you know, sometimes within our own communities, there are a lot of tensions. Um, one, I, one tension I think of in communities of color is, is um, colorism. You know, skin color is important. And, I, you know, I'm so tired of people saying it's, a, it's a just unique to communities of color. It's not unique to communities of color. If I had a dollar for every time a white person said, I was blonde until I was five years old, th that's colorism. <laughs> that's colorism. <laughs> Does anybody disagree? <laughs> and it's okay if you disagree with me, but that's a form of it where we um, place a value on how somebody looks. Um, or features that th over which they had very little control. Um, so the other, so so again, when so colorism may be one, immigration status may be another. And in, in, um, I don't know if, if to what extent you work with um, immigrant communities, but um, immigrant immigration status may be important. Um, first, second, third, fourth generation, you know, sort of seems sort of really important. Documentation status, and especially where there are different documentation statuses within households or communities, and sometimes people weaponize those documentation statuses. It would be important to have that, it, it would be important to have those conversations. Um, another thing we talk about is social class positionality. Um, so um, for people who are in a space, like say they were born and raised working class, but now they're middle class or affluent, that's a, that can be another source of, of stress or psychological distress in terms of uh, community-based factors uh, that emanate from the family around, around difference. Um, we don't want to just focus on problematic kinds of concerns that emerge, but we also want to think about the strengths that and the support that families provide. Um, and that becomes important. How has family helped you and sustained you? And then the final category is interracial, ethnic, and cultural concerns. And that has to do with issues around racism and discrimination. So this multidimensional model was an opportunity to um, sort of frame the discussion much more broadly as opposed to centering on one, partic one particular aspect of culture. Okay. Um, any thoughts or comments before I move on? I want to share one more part of the model. And it's fine. I'm, I, so I've been doing this for 27 years. And so I don't have a problem if you disagree, um, because I think the disagreement helps strengthen the model because it allows us to go back and sort of rethink certain things. Yes. Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because we were earlier this morning we were talking, you know, sort of talking about. I, I think I mentioned that um, uh, when I teach students about having thoughtful conversations and thinking in advance of what they say, and, and sometimes they'll say, uh, "Do I really have to think about it?" But yes, you do really have to think about it because how people are impacted. What seems innocuous to us may be hurtful or judgmental to other. Uh, oh, you were going to say something else? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, I, I grew up saying God bless you, but I've been um, in the workforce long enough to look at people when I say God bless you, they look at me, you know. <laughs> Um, so I just say bless you. Know, I say bless you. Um, and if that's offensive, come and tell me afterwards. I'd love to know the different way of you know sort of saying it. Um, uh, but yes, I think we have to be very intentional about what we say, how we say it, and how the a client experiences it because a client may experience it as a, as a microaggression, which would damage the therapeutic um, alliance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the last thing I want to talk about. Um, yeah, just have five minutes to talk about this. How do you broach? So we've talked a lot about the importance of doing it and the ways that, you know, the dimensions of doing it. But we developed a strategy um, manuscript a few years ago um, that talked about strategies. And we have four particular strategies, joining, assessment, preparation, and delivery. And I'm just going to go through them brief briefly. Joining is, you know, what anybody who's in a helping relationship does is make a connection with um, their, their, their patient, um, using the patient's language to validate and affirm their experience, not minimizing or negating, you know, sort of what they uh, said or invalidating what they said, identifying strengths uh, and resources that um, the, the, the patient brings to the process. But it's really just about connecting. The um, second stage, and I know I'm rushing through this, is the assessment stage. You really need to think about all of these things here before you move forward. One of the things we talk about in counseling is multicultural case conceptualization. And I call it with a go, W-T-H-I-G-O, um, uh, what the heck is going on? That's your goal, <laughs> to figure out what, you know, what's going on in terms of clients, racial identity, gender identity, uh, religion, any of the identity domains that may be important. What, what are they? List, you know, sort of listing them, thinking about them in advance. Um, where are they on the continuum? We said that racial, uh, racial identity was important, and one of the things we talked about, um, and we could do this with any identity domain, but um, if someone is at the lower end of their racial identity development, they probably aren't going to want to talk about race, ethnicity, and culture. They've distanced themselves psychologically from who they are, and so you want to wait for the, you know, the client's you know, sort of readiness. Um, if someone is intensely involved and sort of enmeshed in their racial identity development, Development. There's probably a fair amount of anxiety and hostility um, and even rage sometimes. Um, and so um, in working with those um, patients, we, we want to express some curiosity. Help me understand how you got, you know, help me understand how you got here. What, you know, what is happening? I think I have a minute to tell this story. Um, years ago, um, I was teaching and I had like a 45, 50 year old black woman in my class who was from the deep south. Um, everybody else was like early 20s. And so I was teaching a diversity class. We're talking about um, uh, um, uh, sort of ways groups are framed. And every time we talk about black people, she was like, ah, oh, what are you talking about? I don't understand about black people. And in my mind, if you're from the deep south and you're 50, uh, 15 years ago, that this would not be unfamiliar to you. But it puzzled me. I had a doc student who was, who was um, uh, black also. And after class, she would say, Dr. Davines, I want to get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. And I'm like, we don't do that. <laughs> um, you know, she may not be black enough for you, but we want to you know, exhibit a sense of curiosity. Because there's a reason. So when students are having uh, struggles in my class, I invite them to my office. So I invited her to my office and um, asked her, you know, I know you're struggling with this. And that some of the things that the, student, the other students seem really familiar with, you seem not to know anything about. And I'm just curious about that. And um, she explained to me that she grew up in a very rural community in a very abusive family. Um, there were nine children, and they were very poor. And it got so bad that her mother just left. Can you imagine a mother leaving nine children with an abusive father? And the black community shunned the family, the white community embraced the family. So probably that was an, an effort to adapt to her circumstances. Um, uh, and that um, sort of dissociation was important to, you know, to her survival, I would imagine. But sort of under, so when we talk about multicultural case conceptualization, figuring out what's going on and how is it related to what you, the goals of treatment, um, your relationship and what you want to talk about, what needs to be talked about. 
Um, and thinking about other intersectional identities, um, but the four, five, and six are also important. Patient readiness. Is the patient ready to have this conversation? You may have studied all of this stuff and you're ready, but is the patient ready? Because if the patient ready isn't ready, it's probably going to go south. Ask yourself, what is the strength of the therapeutic relationship um, that would allow us to have or not have this kind of conversation? And do you feel capable of having this conversation? So if, if um, four, five, and six, you're not ready to go on that, then you probably want to have some more supervision so that you can think about how you engage in these conversations. And so once you've sort of assessed what's going on, then you don't, add, you don't broach yet. Um, you prepare, you think you, because you want to be really intentional when you broach, because it could go south if you're not really intentional. Um, so you set an intention. Why am I, why am I broaching this particular topic? How is it going to help the, you know, how is it going to help the patient? Um, uh, you know, what have I done or what do I need to do around multicultural case conceptualization and how does this shape, you know, where I want to go with the patient? Um, step two, we talk about selecting the multidimensional model of broaching behavior that you want to use. Do you want to focus on intercounseling, interindividual, interracial ethnic, interracial ethnic? You know, sort of thinking about that. And step three is labeling different forms of oppression. I'm sorry that you can't see the, the video. Um, and for some of you, you may struggle with this third point. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because I don't really have time. But for oppressed people, I think it's important to name what is going on, uh, not not definitively, declaratively, but with a sense of curiosity, with a sense of um, curiosity, um, uh, as a way of, and with the sense that you might be wrong, um, uh, and to give the patient an opportunity to um, acknowledge, agree, or disagree um, with you. Uh, um, and the example that I'll use, it's not really an example. But the rationale, I would say, women have experienced depression since time immemorial. Why do we get to 2004 or six before we say Me Too? And I would argue that we get to that level without say, without, we get to, to the 21st century before we say Me Too. This is not to discount all the things that have been done to, for women to fight their, the oppression that they experience, but we don't have a language sometimes for what people are experiencing. And so this is to put language, to, you know, help to put language to it. And then finally, the delivery stage is um, where you Ex, you know, you deliver the broaching statement and um, you communicate whatever your broaching statement is and then you allow silence. And we're going back to foundational skills here. And so you are going to reflect content and feeling. One of the, thing I, one of the things I talk to my students about is reflecting will get you out of almost every search situation. Um, and the reason it's important to broaching is because when you reflect, um, you, um, when you, when you reflect, and the patient feels heard and understood, they're going to talk at a deeper emotional level about what's going on. Um, and so reflecting becomes um, uh, in, sort of important in terms of acknowledging what's going on. And there's so much that you learn by just uh, reflecting. Um, there, you know, step four, as appropriate, um, examine the sociopolitical issues that may be undergirding the patient's concerns. And then the step five is gathering information um, outside of the, the counseling relationship um, to learn more about your patients. Uh, I think that is, is critically important um, in terms of having a context, not only their personal context, but a historical context, a socio-political context for how they see and experience the world. So that is, that is the presentation. And we spend um, like a lot, of, a lot more time doing this in class, but that's the, the presentation in a nutshell. And so I'm gonna entertain any questions that you have or comments that you have or, you know, yes. The mic around so the people in line can hear. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, I'm a uh, non psychiatrist person in the room. Uh, I had a patient uh, in the clinic. Um, I was doing stroke clinic, and uh, this patient uh, was African American from, as you said, deep south Tennessee. And uh, she was falling up for stroke, uh, but she started talking about, I mean, I asked her like the history of stroke. So she started talking about how she was mistreated in Tennessee, 
um, you know, just being uh, of a certain race, and uh, the doctor was opposite race, and there was an element of racism. I did listen to her for like 10 minutes, and then um, I was not fully prepared how to go about it in a stroke clinic. So I tried to be empathic as much as I could, but um, she was like redirecting the conversation to the um, you know social issues rather than the uh, the medical care. So in those circumstances, uh, what would be the best thing or the best way to deal with it? Given that you have like a certain you know limited time, you're here for some other problem, and when you're talking about these issues, I, I think the important thing is to acknowledge it because when we look at healthcare disparities in the particularly in the African American community, they are vast. They, they are enormous um, and they shape, people's, um, they shape people's openness to even receiving treatment. And so we know that a lot of times um, African-American patients and other marginalized groups delay treatment, um, not because they're being ne negligent, because there's a fear of what they are going to experience um, in the therapeutic encounter. I would encourage all of you, if you're working with a particular population, I would encourage you to read the history of, 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 their, ex, of their experiences. Um, for, for me, um, I, I write um, about African-Americans also, but what has been most helpful is going back into the literature and figuring out, you know, what, why? Um, my father used to say he didn't like to go to the doctor because of the Tuskegee experiment. And as a child, you don't, you don't really contradict your parents like that. He must have a good reason for saying it's the Tuskegee experiment, but it m never made any sense to me why one experiment shaped his openness to going to the doctor. And then I become a counselor educator and I start reading other things. And it's not about the Tuskegee experiment. As we talked earlier, we, you know, we, Harriet Washington tells us about all, her book is 500 pages long. She tells us about, she catalogs medical abuses. I would say, also say that the past is, um, is prologue. I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna di um, digress too much. But the past is prologue, and I think that's one of the reasons that you might use to engage her in a conversation. So um, I mentioned earlier this book by Raina Hogarth called Medic Medicalizing Blackness, and um, she's a medical historian. And one of the things she does is sort of traces the experiences of, of African Americans from slavery, both in the US and in the Caribbean. And she, um, she talks about some of the things that happened. When I was growing up and we learned about yellow fever, we learned that whites and the, um, indigenous people were immune from yellow fever. But the in, uh, enslaved were told they were not immune to yellow fever. In her book, she, she traces the, um, uh, the actual data and, and it, uh, it appears that blacks were not immune to um, uh, yellow fever. When I say past um, is prologue, Think back to COVID. Early on during COVID, we were told that Black people were not susceptible to COVID. Go oh, keep going to work. You're going to be okay. You, don't, you can't get it. And so that one of the things that, we, that it's important to recognize, it's not, it's, what she is talking about is her experience, but her intergenerational experience and the collective trauma around healthcare and medical abuses and medical experimentation. And um, I imagine you've studied this all in, um, in, in medical school, but um, in one of the things I loved about I shouldn't say I loved it, but what really moved me about Harriet Washington's book is there's a chapter that says that blacks were not even safe in death and, you know, the ex ex exhuming bodies and using them for medical experimentation and not restoring them. And the fact that um, when I first got here, people would say, oh, that's just, you know, myth that that happened. But there were laws on the books. Um, to prevent, prevent it from happening. And medical um, practitioners were involved. Um, medical students were the ones that they were called resurrectionists. Imagine that, resurrectionists. They were the ones that were responsible for coordinating um, the grave robbing that occurred. So your patient may not be able to catalog all of that. And there are a lot of families that can catalog all that, but there are a lot of families that were, for whom there is a lot of shame. And so the trauma carries forward, not the, you know, sort of not, the, not necessarily the experiences. So in that regard, I think it would I give it even in your limited time to at least validate the fact that 
you know, she's probably had a lot of traumatic experiences uh, um, that have shaped how she feels, the fear, the trepidation around getting services. And so people need trusted um, practitioners to help them um, feel safe again. And that's what we want, our, we want regardless of whether they're African-American or anybody else, we want them to feel safe again. Um, so I hope I answered your question. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or comments? Nobody should ask a question around lunchtime. <laughs> Well, I just want to say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure um, sort of talking to you today and being part of this event, and I um, appreciate it. It's a memorable experience.